Okay, uh, today's lecture is uh, about regularization. And if you remember in the previous lecture, we talked about uh, Stein's unbiased risk estimator. And uh, we learned about the behavior of uh, empirical error in the training set and in the test set. And we realized that empirical error for training set has this behavior when x is uh, model complexity or the, ca uh, the capacity of the model. When we have uh, a model with more complexity or higher cap uh, capacity, so the empirical error on training set will decrease. Training error always goes down. And that's not the behavior of true error. The true error has a different error, so at some point with some capacity it goes down and then it still goes going up. So, and that's the point that the model is start to overfeed, start to learn the noise instead of the signal. And we want to avoid this, you know, and the, the role of regularization is to avoid this, right? If you remember in our derivation in the Stein's bias risk estimator, uh, we had a term at the end, and this term was 2 sigma squared summation i equal 1 to n of di, when di was derivative of our uh, function, I mean the estimated function, with respect to the observation. And we discussed that this uh, quantity is a measure of complexity of the model. So if f is a pretty simple model, is a line, and you uh, preterm your observation, it doesn't affect f that much, right? But if f, if f is quite complicated, if it's a polynomial of degree, of high degree, and you preterm one of your observation, then this uh, polynomial has the cap uh, capability I has the capability to uh, feed that point, right? So it will change. So this is a measure of complexity of the model. So, uh, and this had this sort of behavior. And these two together had this behavior, which is the behavior of the true error, okay? So in regularization, you know, this term is not easy to compute, actually. It can be computed in linear cases, but not in nonlinear cases. That's going to be quite complicated to compute this term all the time. But theoretically, we know that this exists. So in, in regularization, what we are going to do is to add a term to our empirical error, training error, which has this sort of behavior. So it goes up with complexity. And most of the time, this term is heuristic. It's not this, this term which is com complicated to compute. It's a heuristic term in many cases. So in general, we have an objective function. And this objective function is the function of uh, theta, the parameters of the model, and objective of uh, input x and target variable y. Then we are going to add a penalty function. This is, this is going to have the, a, a role similar to this, you know, and this penalty function has this type of behavior. It, it goes up with the complexity of the model, okay? But most of the time it's completely heuristic, you know, we just add something to, uh, to, to make sure that this has this type of behavior. So the, the uh, first thing that we can do in neural network uh, possibly is uh, weight decay. And in weight decay, actually, the term, the penalty function that we are going to add is the uh, squared norm, is, is the norm of the W. So we penalize the model with large W, okay? So we have training error J and we penalize the model with uh, 
W's that are large, basically we want W to be a small, okay? So that might be uh, somehow counterintuitive. Uh, <coughs> number of nodes in a neural network intuitively has something to do with the complexity of the model. The more node that you have, the model is more complex, is more capable. Uh, the number of layers has something to do with the capacity of the model. But weights, small weights, correspond to less capable model or less complex model and, and larger weights uh, has to do with more complex model. Uh, intuitively, do you have any idea how does this, I mean, we go, we show mathematically how it works, but intuitively, do you have any idea that why large weights leads to, you know, you have a model with some number of layers and some number of nodes. You don't change that. You are going to learn this model. If the optimal weights, the norm of weights, are larger compared to the case that are smaller, the one with larger weights is the behavior of that is, uh, in terms of nonlinearity, is is more basically nonlinear. It's it's more capable, or it's, has the possibility to to feed the data uh, in in a more uh, flexible way. Intuitively, can you explain this? Why? Yes. Is it because of, like it kind of establishes a better priority system among your inputs and everything? Because if you take everything to be a small weight, mm -hmm. then you're not really considering everything as adequately as like, oh, I know that this thing is more important, so it should have a higher weight? Um, so how, how do you interpret weights in this case? It's, it's, it's not weight of the input, mm -hmm. you know? It, it's weights of many different layers. Yes? You want? Maybe, like, is that, could, could it be that the, if you're going to push all the weights to like a larger value, the ones that will get sent back Yes? I would say that large weights mean that there is almost like higher variance caused by perturbations. So whenever you have an outlier, it's easier to fit to that outlier if it's far away from the mean. And so if you have large weights, they can fit to the outliers better than they can actually fit mm -hmm. to the mean itself. Okay, let's look at this mathematically and maybe it give us some insight to the problem. Uh, Okay, in, in general, for regularization, we have an objective function, and this objective function is uh, a function of our parameters and input. And then we add uh, a penalty to the function. Okay, let's call this new function, your objective function, J tilde. Uh, in this case, actually, our parameters are uh, W, so J tilde W, and I just simplify this. I don't write X and Y anymore. So J tilde W is basically some J W, so some function of our uh, parameters, plus a penalty function. In this case, the penalty is norm of W. Okay. And the claim is that uh, it can basically restrict the, the capacity of the model, restricting the weight. Uh, Okay, before we go through this and explain why it happens, in, in practice, you can see that it's going to be quite easy if you want to implement this. You know, we learned about uh, backpropagation. In backpropagation, you compute the new weight, 
based on the uh, old weight minus some learning rate and derivative of your objective function. In this case, the derivative objective function would be the derivative of instead of j, it's going to be j tilde. And the derivative of j tilde would be the derivative of g, j plus uh, <coughs> plus some alpha w. That's the only thing that you need to do if you want to implement uh, this, which is called weight decay. When you penalize with the norm of weight, it's called weight decay. If you want to uh, implement weight decay, in practice, the only thing that you need to do in your backpropagation algorithm, you just need to add alpha w to your updating rule. That's all. OK, but <coughs> uh, how we can justify this mathematically? OK, I, I'm going to start with uh, using Taylor expansion and write uh, you know, an approximation for j. And if you remember, you know, uh, Taylor expansion, you know, if you have function x uh, based on Taylor expansion, it can be written as f a. a is a point. And, uh, and in the neighbor of that point, actually, you can expand it by, that's going to be uh, f a plus, um, what was that, f prime a, one factorial x minus a plus f double prime a two factorial x minus a squared and so on, you know, infinitely many term if it's uh, differentiable infinitely. Okay, so in this case, I'm going to approximate j uh, with Taylor expansion, and I'm going to approximate it uh, at or around the point W star. And I assume W star is an optimum point. So if W star is an optimum point, then J uh, W can be written as j at w star plus the first derivative means derivative of j at point w star. So it's going to be this term, derivative of j at point w star. What's the derivative of j at point w star? Zero. It is zero because we assume that w star is an optimum point. If it's an optimum point, then derivative at point w star would be zero. But what about the second term? The second derivative divided by 2 factorial and uh, times w minus w star squared. This is for a scalar, right? It is for uh, univariate. So if the, this is w is a vector. So basically, it's going to be w minus w star. So it's uh, quadratic. w minus w star transpose the second derivative, the first derivative Jacobian, the second derivative like Haitian, right? Times W minus W star. So that's my second derivative, my Haitian. That's going to be the second term. And I can go on with the third term and so on, approximated. But that's enough uh, for our purpose. So that's uh, an approximation of j. Let's show it by j hat. Uh, so I can rewrite this j tilde with my approximation j hat. So j 
tilde hat is going to be JW, and JW I wrote, uh, I wrote this approximation for. Uh, plus alpha one half w squared. Okay, that's j tilde hat. Okay, in optimization, we take the derivative of our objective function and set it to zero. If I take the derivative of this j tilde hat, it's going to be derivative of j at point w hat, which is 0, plus this is quadratic, so 2 times 1 half is 1. It's going to be h times w minus w star, right? This is derivative of this term. Plus derivative of alpha 1 half w to the power of 2, so it's quadratic again. So it's going to be alpha w. Okay. And if I want to do optimization, I should set this to 0 and solve for w to find the optimum w. So uh, <coughs> it is h w minus w star plus alpha w equal to 0. So h w minus h w star plus alpha w equal to 0. So I factored this w. It's going to be h plus alpha is a scalar, so i alpha. h is n by n matrix. You know, I put n by n i here and factor w for these two terms equal to h w star. And if I solve for W, W is going to be H plus I alpha uh, inverse H W star. So based on this Taylor expansion approximation of my objective function, I can uh, basically solve for the derivative of the objective function, I mean penalize objective function, and I can say that's going to be my w. Okay, uh, in this case, you can see that if alpha is equal to zero, you know, if alpha is zero, then w is what? Is w a star, right? Because if alpha is 0, then this is 0. It's going to be h inverse times h identity w star. So it, it makes sense, right? If alpha is 0, means you, don't, you didn't penalize your objective function. So nothing will change. You have your optimal point, which is w star. But <clears throat> in the case that alpha is not 0 and alpha is greater than 0, what's going to happen. <clears throat> to see what's going to happen, I'm going to take some more steps here. First, I'm going to do eigen, uh, I mean, uh, singular value decomposition on my Hessian matrix. So I'm going to write H as Q lambda Q transpose, right? You remember singular value decomposition, right? It's uh, like x can be written as u uh, delta v transpose for any x, right? When u is 
eigenvectors of x, x transpose, v is eigenvectors of x transpose x, and lambda is a diagonal matrix with singular values. So in this case, H is symmetric because it's Hessian matrix. So H, H transpose and H transpose H are the same. So eigenvectors of H, H transpose and H transpose H are the same. So it's both of them are Q. <coughs> okay. Um, and I'm going to replace this here. So W is going to be Q lambda Q transpose plus I times alpha Q is orthonormal matrix. Q Q transpose is identity because it's orthonormal. So I replace this identity by Q Q transpose. So it's going to be Q Q transpose alpha. And alpha is a scalar, actually. I can write it as even Q alpha, Q transpose. Uh, inverse H W star. Okay, I'm going to write it, write this bracket this way. It's Q times lambda plus I alpha Q transpose. So I factored this Q transpose and I factored this Q. Then I have to take the inverse of this. H W star. And if I apply this inverse, the inverse of Q transpose will be Q is orthonormal matrix. It's Q, right? So the inverse of Q transpose will be Q times the inverse of uh, lambda plus I alpha times the inverse of Q, which is Q transpose because Q is orthonormal. Uh, and I replace H actually with Q lambda Q transpose W star. This Q transpose Q is going to be I identity because it's orthonormal. So this is going to be like Q lambda plus I alpha inverse lambda Q transpose W star. <coughs> this is my W. Okay, so here again you can appreciate that if alpha is zero, and this is going to be lambda inverse times lambda, which is identity, and then you have QQ transpose, which is identity, it's going to be W star. Nothing will change if alpha is uh, zero. But what is this quantity in general? You know, lambda is <coughs> a diagonal matrix with singular values. And then plus I times alpha. So it's as if you add alpha to all of these diagonal values. And then you take inverse. What's the inverse of diagonal matrix? It's 1 over, because these are all positive, right? It's 1 over lambda 1 plus alpha, alpha 1 over lambda 2 plus alpha, and so on. And then you multiply this with lambda. So it's going to be like lambda 1, lambda 2, lambda n. So this quantity basically has this form. So this quantity has the form of lambda i divided by lambda i plus alpha. Uh, 
Okay, so if if alpha is zero, this is one. Okay, so if this is one. Nothing will happen. If alpha is not zero, so let's consider two cases. The case that lambda i is greater than alpha means the singular value is quite large. Singular value is quite large means what? Means that I'm talking about, I mean, corresponding, you know, this is the decomposition of my Hessian matrix. And in the decomposition of Hessian matrix, I have some eigenvectors and have some, some eigenvalues. And uh, eigenvectors are corresponding to these eigenvalues. This eigenvalue is large means its corresponding eigenvector is important, you know. Hessian shows the landscape of my search. It's an important uh, direction of search, you know. I have lots of variants there. And lambda is small, eigenvalue is small. Means that direction is not that important direction, you know. In, in, in my landscape. Now, suppose that lambda i is large. If lambda i is large, then what can I what can I say about lambda i divided by lambda i plus alpha? It approaches to one, right? But in the case that lambda i is a small with respect to alpha, what can I say about this quantity. Sorry? The approach is to zero. Right? In the limit, the approach is to zero. So, so something interesting actually happened here. It, it tells me that, you know, in this uh, matrix, depends on the value of lambda and alpha some of them would be close to one and some of them would be close to zero, right? What is going to be close to zero? Cases that lambda is small, corresponding direction of search in the landscape is not important. One, corresponding direction of search in the landscape is important. So what it does basically, this, um, what it does is to uh, limit direction of search based on its importance. So you have some capacity, but the effective capacity would be different when you sh shrink the weights, okay? So basically, as if you're searching only in the important directions and ignore some other directions. Uh, still, intuitively, it may not be clear, but if you look at the behavior of uh, activation function, it may become more clear uh, You know, if this is my objective function, when weight is small, I'm in this region. When weights get larger, I go to these regions, right? So this region means my activation function after each layer is linear. And this means my, my activation function after each layer is quite nonlinear. So when you keep weights small, it's as if you're controlling that the behavior of the whole model is closer to a linear behavior. And when weights get larger, behavior could be significantly nonlinear, okay? Uh, so that was just for intuition and insight, and that's sort of mathematical justification that why weight decay works. Any question here? Yes. Uh, 
It cannot. If the model is completely linear, it's just linear. You know, if you don't have activation function, the model collapses just to a linear model. And it cannot find nonlinear patterns. I didn't say that it's going to be linear. So it's closer to, I mean, take a linear as one extreme, right? This is one extreme, and this is quite nonlinear. So this restriction on weight makes your model closer to nonlinear. It, it doesn't make it nonlinear. It makes it closer to linear. It means that it's less complex. Yes? Uh, is that true for all certain activation functions, or is it just true for any nonlinear functions in general? If the coefficients are smaller, it's going to be... The other mathematical proof doesn't have in, to do with the activation function. That was just for intuition. Uh, no, I mean, this justification shows that regardless of the form of activation function, it's going to help us to go to the uh, important, significant directions of Haitian. No, no, W W is a vector, and W star is a vector. All of them, all of them are vector. Point is point in high dimensional space. It's not a scale. No. So whatever the, the optimal value is, you know, your, your depends on how many parameters your model has. Your model has 100 parameters, is a vector of dimensionality 100. It has 1 million, it's a dimension of 1 million. Sorry? Optimum point of the optimization means it's a minimum. It's a minimum of the objective function. It's a point which makes the gradient zero. Yes. The, the function is a scalar function, means it returns in a scalar, which is the, the amount of error. But the input to the function is not a scalar, it's a vector. If you compute norm, for example, if you compute for Vinius norm of x minus x hat, this X could be a matrix, right? But this norm is a scalar. The objective function is a scalar, I mean, returns a scalar. But the input to the function is a vector. There was a question? Yes. What, what do you mean exactly? We are not, we have a hypothesis class, which is the class of uh, neural networks, okay. right? And uh, this, this neural network is going to be a surrogate for our true function. We never find that true function. But some true functions you can't find, right? So if the true function is maybe like a linear equation. You can't find any true function, you know? No, we just have a model of that true function. We never find that true function. Okay. 
Okay, um... So this L2 norm is called, uh, this is called uh, weight decay. And this is basically is going to be effective number of parameters. You know, when, when alpha is small, this is going to be one, right? If all of the eigenvalues are large, then this, this gamma is going to be same as the number of parameters that you have. But uh, in practice, some of them are smaller, quite close to zero. So this is called effective number of parameters in weight decay. OK, uh, another way of regularization, in, which is quite common in practice in neural network, is data set augmentation. And data set augmentation basically means that you have a data set of some endpoints, for example. You augment your data by adding some fake data to your data. Okay. So, how do we do this in practice? You know, you have images, for example. You uh, images of MNIST, for example. All of them are centered. You know, <coughs> you just make some distortion in these images shift them to the right, shift them to the left, rotate them a little bit, so on and so forth, right? And you add, the <coughs> you add them to your uh, training set. And with the example about overfitting that we had before, you can appreciate the fact that having this more information can uh, help the model to generalize, to, to understand uh, the nature of digit instead of learning, you know, the tiny features of each of single ones, you know. When you rotate an image a little bit and tell the model it's still two, you know, that was two and this is also two. So it helps the model intuitively to, to uh, basically learn. One way to augment the data is using generative model. That's going to be quite advanced way of making fake data. We will learn about generative models later in this course, like GAN or diffusion model. And you can potentially use GAN or uh, diffusion or any generative model to generate some fake data and add it to your training set. Uh, another way of uh, regularization is noise injection. Okay. And noise injection basically can be in two different form. It, you can add noise to the input, and adding noise to the input is one form of data augmentation as well, making fake data. And another way of noise injection is adding noise to the weights. This also can be mathematically uh, justified when you add, when, I mean, you can justify adding noise to data as uh, data augmentation. And you can justify adding noise to the weight as sort of uh, Bayesian inference over weights. Bayesian inference in the sense that when you want to you have a Bayesian neural network in a sense that when you want to compute a weight, it's not just a point estimate. You know, you compute a distribution of this weights, posterior of weights given. Uh, and there exist uh, Bayesian neural networks, so it, you can show that adding noise is an approximation of those type of inference, which we don't go through the details. You can check the uh, slides later. I don't go through the details with the same similar justification that we had for um, uh, adding L2 nor You can have for uh, adding noise to the data and see that that's a, a form of regularization. It's as if you're adding a term to uh, the objective function. <coughs> so manifold tangent classifier is quite interesting in terms of the idea that they have. 
it's not that common in practice. At least the current form is not common in practice, but that's quite interesting. And uh, the intuition The intuition behind this is that uh, the date, if, suppose that you want to do classification. The intuition is that all points of each class are on a submanifold. Okay? Uh, can you give me a, a piece of paper? Uh, thank you. You know, this is my, my favorite example, actually, whenever I want to talk about manifold. You know, if, if I show you these points, you know, just look at the, the, the points. Don't look at the paper. Just look at the points. What's the dimensionality of these points? Just look at the points. Sure. You want to locate these points. How many measurements do you need? Three, right? You need three measurements to locate these points. Because in, it's a three-dimensional space. But if I unfold this paper and show you these points, these points are still in a three-dimensional space, but there is a two-dimensional coordinate here and using this two-dimensional coordinate, you can locate all of these points. You know, the, the third coordinate is zero for all of them, right? With two dimensions, I can locate these points. The reason is that these three-dimensional points are on a manifold of, uh, with uh, intrinsic dimensionality of two. So we have a manifold of intrinsic dimensionality two in a three-dimensional space and so if I find this manifold and unfold it, then I can reduce the dimensionality of the data uh, significantly in many cases without losing much information, okay? So it's, it's a valid assumption to assume that your real world data are on some manifold. Uh, another way of looking at the concept of manifold, in not, not geometrically, uh, is basically in terms of degree of freedom of the information that you have in a data set. You know, if I capture a picture of my hand and uh, it's, what's the dimensionality of this point? Depends on the resolution of my camera. It could be quite high dimensional point, right? Then I can rotate my hand and take another picture and rotate my hand and take another picture and rotate my hand and take another picture. These are, depends on uh, resolution, say, one million dimensional points. But in fact, the degree of freedom is only one. You know, it's, it, it just has to do with this angle. All of these images are the same except that this angle are different. So the, all of these points are on one dimensional manifold. The intrinsic dimensionality of the manifold contains all of these points in this one dimensional space is one. All of them are in a one dimensional care. Okay? So it, it's quite a realistic assumption that points uh, with any type of nature could be in a, a manifold with uh, intrinsic dimensionality way less than the dimensionality of the space, okay, that uh, represent them. So the assumption of this model is that, for example, you want to do classification. The assumption is that each class is on a manifold, okay? So I have a classification problem and there is a manifold contains class one, and there's another manifold contains class two. 
So I have a point here, and uh, forget neural network for the moment. I have a point here, and it has been classified to class one. And uh, there is a point here I want to classify. If I go by nearest neighbor, for example, instead of neural network, I may assume that, okay, this is close to this one. And so it should have the same labels, right? But this is not true, in fact, because they are close in terms of Euclidean distance. But in fact, they're on two different manifolds. And they have two different classes. This points compared to this distance has a much larger distance. But they are on the same manifold and they have same classes. So distance by itself, I mean Euclidean distance by itself, could be misleading. May not be a good measure of deciding that it's in the same class or it's not in the same class. But if I have a way to decide that it is in the same manifold, that could be, uh, you know, that could help my model. So the idea is that instead of looking at the Euclidean distance between two points, if I look at the distance between each point and the tangent space of the manifold, okay? So basically, the tangent space of this point, the tangent of the manifold at this point is this. And I'm not looking at the distance of this point and this point. I'm looking at the distance of point and the tangent space. And I realize it's small, right? If it was not a manifold, it was a subspace that's, that was zero, right? Everything is on, on that subspace. But the distance between this point and this tangent space is, is larger than this. So it's more... Uh, informative than looking at the Euclidean distance between two points. If I look at the distance between a point and the tangent space of the manifold for, for the other point. Um, the uh, intuition behind this method is that, it, and it's quite old method, 1992, is that if f is my function, like my neural network. Derivative of x, derivative of f of x with respect to x should be orthogonal to the tangent space v. So this is my tangent space. This is my tangent space. And my estimation or my neural network in the ideal case should be orthogonal to this. Why orthogonal to this means that if I perturb the point along this direction on the manifold, it shouldn't change. It shouldn't change the prediction. If you decided that this is one and that they start to perturb the point along this line, don't change your decision. It's still one. But if I go to another manifold, then, then change your decision. Okay, so in this case, the, in, in, in ideal form, the derivative of f with respect to x, I want this to be orthogonal to v. So I want to penalize this value, make it a small. So I can add this as a penalty function to my objective function when I decide to minimize the derivative of f with respect to w, I add this as a penalty function. That was the idea in 1992, and it's quite hard in practice to, to implement it because we don't know this v. We don't know the tangent space. Uh, a more recent paper, they tried to approximate this tangent space based on the data and the, the formula is not explicitly depends on the tangent space, okay? And you can have an objective function this way. It's, it's, it's pretty interesting mathematically. In practice, uh, not, not that common. 
Any question about this? When you prepare the point, when you po change the points, f will change. You know, you have a neural network and you change the f x, it will change, right? Mm -hmm. The only thing that you want to do is to control the change and make it minimal in some directions and let it go in some other directions. You know, by adding this penalty, you restrict the change in some directions. You say that in the direction of you know, it originally it changes in all directions. Mm -hmm. By adding this penalty, you tell the function that if the change is in this direction, don't change. If if the perturb if point has been perturbed in this direction, don't change. So you don't need to add something to make sure that when you go up, it changes. It changes all the time for any uh, perturbation of the data. You just restrict it in this direction. In other direction, it still goes. Go on. Okay, yes? Isn't finding the, the right manifold like the same task as finding what feature in the data set is really important in making the class? Like, for example, with a paper analogy, say you have a bunch of points in the paper, and then you have a bunch of points in the whiteboard then eventually, if you just train a linear model, you'll find out that the third dimension is the only one that matters. Mm -hmm. So the third dimension will have really high weight. Isn't that the same thing? Like, what's the point with the manifold and all of that? No, it's not the same thing. Um, if you want to talk, uh, talk about this in terms of features, then we have a distinction between feature selection and feature extraction. What do you say is feature selection? I have one million features, and I decide that the third feature is the most important one, and some other features are important, and the rest are not important. That's feature selection. Feature extraction means that I compute new features, a feature which is not any of these one million features. I compute new features. If this is subspace, this new feature is going to be linear combination of all of these features. And if it's nonlinear, it's going to be a, a nonlinear function of these like features. The Sorry? Like the rotation would be nonlinear. Rotation is a linear. linear. Yeah, rotation is linear. Um, no, you can assume that you know if you have if you have x in terms of like you have x one to x d. Feature selection means that, okay, I decided this is important, yeah. right? And I go from D dimension to one dimension. That's feature selection. But feature extraction means that I decided that W1X1 plus W2X2 plus WDXD with some set of Ws are the, the most important feature that I can work with. If you do, for example, PCA, which is linear, you're going to have this, and a linear uh, combination, weighted sum of your features. But if you assume the data is not on a subspace, it's a manifold, then it's not just a weighted sum. It's a nonlinear function of x1 to xd, but the output is just one x, right? Okay, early stopping. Uh, this is quite common, very common. You know, data augmentation is common. Adding noise is common. Early stopping is very, very common, and early stopping means that you stop early. You know. That, that's it. I mean, uh, don't go to the end. You want to optimize, you know, instead of going up to the end, uh, stop your training, you know, early and uh, take a validation set as, as soon as 
you see the validation set, set doesn't change much, you know, stop, or even sometimes before that, you stop, okay? Uh, <coughs> intuitively, you can appreciate that why it works, because in many cases, these models that we have are over-parameterized, you know, it's, it's too complex models. And if you push it enough, you know, to find, you know, really good local minima for the, ob for the objective function, you, you are in the overfitting regime and you don't want to be there, right? But also you can justify this uh, mathematically. You know, th you remember the object, the Taylor expansion that we had. And Taylor expansion of the function was in this form. In the, in the weight decay form, we had one half W squared add to this, which we don't have it here. So, uh, you know, we have uh, J, which is a function of W, and be approximated by um, Taylor expansion as J W star plus one uh, half W minus W star S in W minus W star, right? This is my Taylor expansion approximation uh, of the model. Okay, let me, maybe it's better if I just write it on the board. Uh, so this is my upper Taylor expansion of the, our objective function. And if I take a derivative of this, Then it's going to be derivative of g at point w star, which is 0, plus this one, which is h times w minus w star, right? And uh, the update function, the update rule would be at point t plus 1, I have to have the weight at point T minus some learning rate uh, derivative of uh, J prime, sorry, J uh, hat or J. Okay, that's my learning rule. So, uh, so basically WT plus one, is going to be WT minus some rho and derivative of J hat would be like H W minus W star. So W a star is optimum again. Okay. So W T plus one, my, my, the value of W in T plus one iteration is equal to W T minus W star. I just subtract W star from both sides minus rho H W minus W star. And I factor this there. This is going to be um, I minus rho H, W minus W star, right? So uh, W T plus one is going to be I minus rho H, W minus W star plus W star. 
Yes. How are we able to factor out W, T, and W? Uh, why are they the same term? How, sorry? Uh, we factor out W, T minus W star, and then W minus W star. Aren't W and W, T? So uh, this is, sorry, W, T. Okay. Right? It's always W, T. If I keep going for T steps, capital T, if I keep going for T steps, then W at T, capital T, if I t write it in terms of W0, W0, my initial point, it's going to be I minus rho H to the power of t, right? And this is going to be w0 minus w star plus w star. Do you see this? That it's going to be y. I mean, if, if you don't see this, just write, as, write it as Just assume that like t is equal to zero. If t is equal to zero, then this one, this term is going to be like uh, w1 is going to be i minus rho h w0 minus w star plus w star. And then assume t is equal to one then W2 is going to be I minus rho H, W1 minus W star plus W star. And then W1 is this term. If you replace it, you can see that it's going to be I minus rho H squared. And then I minus rho H to the power of whatever number of steps that you have if you compare it with W, no, W0. Okay, so that's my W at point T. Let's do the same trick that we did before, right? H as Q lambda Q transpose, okay? If I write H as Q lambda Q transpose, then WT is going to be I minus uh, rho uh, Q lambda Q transpose to the power of T. It's not a good notation, actually. This T is not transpose, transpose. you know? I don't know, maybe I write like... Uh, it's not transpose. Uh, it's better now. W0 minus W star plus W star, right? Okay, do the same trick. Write it as Q, Q transpose. What we did before. So this is going to be Q... I minus rho lambda Q transpose W minus W star plus W star. Okay. Uh,
So, uh, you know, these are orthonormal matrices. I can take them outside this. You know, and why? Because, you know, it's going to be like Q, some values, Q transpose to the power of 2, for example. We're going to have Q, A, Q transpose, and then these two will be identity, right? So it's as you have like Q, A squared, Q transpose. And if it's cubic, again, so you're going to have Q, A to the power of 3, Q transpose. So uh, it's basically Q, I minus rho, delta to the power of tau Q transpose. OK, look at this term now. I minus rho lambda to the power of tau. Uh, lambda is, again, eigenvalues of the Hessian matrix. And um, so it's going to be for one element. It's going to be 1 minus rho lambda i. So you have 1 minus rho lambda i to the power of tau. Suppose that lambda i is small. If lambda is a small, then 1 minus one minus rho lambda i of power of tau. And suppose the tau is very large. Then what this is going to be? It's going to be 1, right? So it will approach to 1. We assume that tau is very large. If lambda i is large, If lambda is quite, a s sorry, if it's quite a small, yes. If it's quite a small, it's going to be 1 minus a very small value, so almost 1. Even if it is, you know, 0.95 to the power, to a big power, to zero. Yes, yes, but I assume lambda is very small. So very small in, uh, compared to 1. I mean, lambda. So maybe you say that rho lambda i is very small, then compared to 1, then it's, it's closer to 1 than 0. And if it's large, but large but less than 1, you know, then it's going to be, it's going to 0. Okay. So, this is the number of iterations, and the suggestion of this method is to stop early. If I do not stop early and keep going, make this tau large, what's going to happen is that for large eigenvalues, this is going to be, uh, for large eigenvalues, this is going to be zero. Means uh, for large eigenvalues, as if I'm not, when, when, when tau is large, for large eigenvalues means in significant directions, I'm not searching anymore, you know, for large amount of tau. For large amount of tau, I'm just searching on important directions, you know, directions that are not important. So that's one reason that your model has a huge capacity, right? And you keep going up to some point, you learn the main features, means you are searching in the right directions of the Haitian. After that, the effect of 
important features, important directions of the landscape in your search is almost negligible. You're not doing anything for, for those important features. They have been learned already. You are learning, you know, unimportant directions. And this is what overfitting means. Overfitting means you're learning something that's not important. Noise, you know, unimportant features. So that's the reason that, or that's the justification that uh, early stopping works. <coughs> Uh, parameter tying and parameter sharing. Uh, it means that, you know, you have some number of parameters. You have 10 parameters. And you tie some of parameters together. Means that, you know, I, pi, uh, I tie five of these parameters together and the other five together. I have 10 parameters, but I force that all of these five have the same values and all of these five have the same value. I, I tied them, okay? Um, why it helps, in fact, convolutional neural network, which is going to be the next topic of the, or the next model that we are going to learn, is exactly the same, you know? You can see convolutional neural network as one form of fit forward neural network in which some of the work, some of the weights are tied to each other or shared, you know. Um, there are uh, a sparsity in, in, in total, you know, you, you may think in, in, in general, you may think that, uh, let me, Forget about neural networks. Suppose that I want to fit just a linear model. And this linear model is in the form of beta transpose x. And beta is d-dimensional and x is d-dimensional. So it's in fact beta 1 x1 plus beta 2 x2 up to beta d xd, right? Um, and suppose x are different uh, measurements, you know, I want to decide about the health of a person and this d are the, the different measurements like blood pressure and cholesterol and so on and so forth. Do you think, I mean compare these two cases, b is dense beta is dense. Is dense means all of them have values. Means in my model I consider all uh, measurements. I consider blood pressure and cholesterol and uh, you know the uh, glucose and the history of the person and so on and so forth. Compared to the case that beta is sparse only some of these features have been considered. I decide only based on blood pressure and cholesterol. And I ignore everything else. Which one is better? You know, I have Y and Y shows that this person has heart disease or not. Okay, and I can fit this. It gives me a dense beta, means it gives me coefficient for all of the measurements that I had, right? But compared to the case that I make this beta sparse by adding some L1 norm, for example, which one would be better? Yes. Like 
It is more computationally expensive to compute this, but my, my, my point was about the intuition behind it. I mean, intuitively, you may think that always dense should be better because there are 100 different measurements about this person. I'm considering all of them, you know, I'm considering not only blood pressure and uh, the uh, cholesterol, but also I consider the history of this person and I consider the glucose and so on and so forth, right? Compared to the case that I ignore many things about this person and co I consider only the blood pressure and cholesterol. So intuitively it seems that the, the dense case would be better, but in fact it's not the case, you know, and there is unofficial rule in statistics or machine learning. It's called bet on sparsity. You can bet on a sparse at any time that you can make a model a sparse, make it a sparse. And it generalizes better. And it's it's sort of counterintuitive. But in fact that's that's true in all cases. Even it's true in your life, you know, make yourself a sparse, really, you know, if if you care about everything in the world compared to the case that you have some priorities. You know, I care about this and that, and I don't care about, I don't <laughs> give a damn to every, anything else, you know. The, the second case, you, you, you perform much better and you generalize much better and, you know, and, and, and be a sparse. So um, a sparse model are, are, are uh, perform much better in, in machine learning in their mathematical justification behind that. So parameter sharing and tying is one sort of making the models, it's not exactly making it sparse, sparse means with <coughs> knock, knock down all, some of these parameters, but it's one way of making the models more, more sparse, okay? So we are uh, out of time, we'll talk about, uh, uh, I think, the only other thing that we need to talk about in regularization is bagging and uh, then drop out, which is quite important, and then we are done with regularization for next lecture. Okay, have a good weekend. Thank you.